The Buddha says that when we experience pain, stress, suffering, the mind has two reactions. One is bewilderment. We don't understand how the suffering has come. And the, the second is a search. Is there anyone out there who knows a way or two to put an end to the suffering? Which means that we're looking for three kinds of truth. We're looking for someone who truly knows. The way to put it into suffering. We're looking for the words that describe that way. We hope that they're true words. And then we're looking for the truth, an actual experience where there is no suffering. Now, for the most part, we tend to be disappointed. Either people who say they know the way, but it turns out they don't. Or maybe they don't know how to describe the way, if they have found it. And so we don't get to the truth of the end of suffering itself. But with the Buddha we have one, a person who is true. He truly knows. And as we chant every day, Surakato Bhagavata Tamo, the, the Dhamma of the Blessed One is well taught. So his words are true. But simply listening to the words is not going to take us to the truth of the end of suffering. That's something we have to do, and that's where we have to be true in really applying ourselves to the practice. This is why the Buddha said that discernment comes in three levels. There's the discernment that comes from listening, and the discernment that comes from thinking things through. And we've listened to a lot of Dharma, we've thought a lot about the Dharma. What remains is the discernment that comes from developing. We may have started developing already. I don't think there's anybody sitting here who's brand new to meditation. It's simply a question of how much energy you put into it and how much discernment you bring to this. And basically, two things we have to think about. One is committing ourselves to the practice, and the second is reflecting. The Buddha himself said, this is how the Dharma is found, by committing yourself to the Dharma and then reflecting what you're doing. The commitment means that you're going to try to do this as well as you can, because it's only in do doing things as well as you can that you're going to learn where you're still lacking, and where you still need improvement. If you just go through the motions, part of you knows that you're not really expecting much in terms of the results. And so when the results don't come, you're not surprised. But you haven't really learned anything. This is why the Buddha uses the word commitment. You really give yourself to this. Like right now, you're trying to stay with the breath, mindful to stay with the breath. Keep it in mind each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out. And if another thought comes in, you remind yourself, say, no, that's not what we're here for. We're here to work on concentration. Alertness, watching three things. Your intention is to stay here. You're watching the breath to make sure it's comfortable. And that connects with the feeling, the feeling of ease that you're trying to create here. That gives you three of the establishings of mindfulness right there. Body, feelings, mind. And when you can bring those together, then they gain strength from one another. In other words, your intentions are focused on the breath. Your awareness fills the body. The breath fills the body. The sense of ease fills the body. And this way it gives the mind a good place to stay in the present moment, because if you have a very narrow awareness of the present moment, it's not a pleasant place to stay. You feel squeezed, you feel constrained. But if you can spread out and fill this territory, it's a spacious place to be. As for the fourth 
establishing of mindfulness and dhammas. Those are basically the qualities of mind that you have to bring to bear to protect the other three. In other words, if any of the hindrances show up, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and anxiety, uncertainty, those are things you have to get rid of, because otherwise they will eat away at your concentration. As for skillful qualities like the factors for awakening, mindfulness, your analysis of what's going on in the present moment, your persistence, a sense of rapture, calm, concentration, equanimity. Those are things that you try to give rise to whether they're not there, and when they are there, then you try to maintain them. This is how all four of the establishings of mindfulness work together. And as you develop these, then it really becomes a good place to stay right here. The mind is more and more inclined to want to be here, to be happy to be here. So try to bring all these things together. And when they're brought together, that's when they grow. It's like a seed. If the seed is in a little plastic bag someplace and the soil is in another plastic bag someplace else, and they're hidden away in the dark, away from the sun and away from the water, the seed is not going to grow. But if you put them all together, you put the seed in the soil and the soil in the, in the sun and then the water on the seed, the seed's going to grow. So it's the same with the body, feelings, and your awareness here. When they come together, then they grow. The sense that they become one. I mean, you wouldn't want to separate them out again. That's concentration. Discernment is when you begin to see that they still are separate things, even though they inhabit the same place. But for the time being, you let that question of discernment be put aside for the time being. So you really do want to work on getting things together. Because it is possible to, later on to divide them up in accordance with your preconceived notions, but that's not necessarily where the best places are to divide them. But when you brought them together, then the various components eventually will begin to separate out. And John Lee's images of having a rock and you know that there's tin, and there's lead, and there's silver, and there's gold in the rock. But if you try to use a toothpick or an axe, pickaxe, to get the, these minerals out, they're not going to come out. What you have to do is you heat the rock. The rock sits right there, and then when the melting point for tin comes, the tin will fl come flowing out. You raise the heat a little bit more, then it reaches the melting point for lead. The lead comes flowing out. You raise until you get to the melting point for silver. The silver comes flowing out. Finally, the same thing with the gold. They separate themselves out on their own through the intensity of your practice. And here the intensity means intense mindfulness and intense alertness, as continuous as you can make them. As centered as you can make them. This is where the element of your truth as a person comes in. As you can be with the breath for a while and then wander off someplace else. It's like submitting the, the rock to some heat, but even before it gets to any of the melting points, you've taken it out of the heat. Well, it's going to cool down. Then you come back and you heat it up a little bit more. But again, just before it gets to the tin smelting point, you take it out. Keep on doing this, no matter how much heat you put in, no matter how much effort you put in, it's not going to get anywhere because it's not continuous. It's when you are continually aware, continually alert, continually mindful. That's when the practice develops momentum and it gathers strength. So it's in this way that your truth as a practitioner is what's going to make all the difference. Because the Buddha truly knows the words he used to describe the path to awakening, the, what the results of that path are going to be, those are true. 
And the truth of nirvana is true in itself. But as long as you aren't true, then you're not going to get to that experience of the truth, and you won't really know how true the Buddha is and how true his words are. So that's the missing truth, the truth of your application as your practice. But that's something you can make true. If you couldn't make it true, then there'd be no purpose in the Buddha's teaching to begin with. That's because it is something you can become more and more truthful about, more truthful in your application, more truthful in your commitment to the practice. Reflecting on what you're doing and making adjustments. The reflection is what leads to discernment. The commitment brings more concentration. The two of them acting together. That's how all these truths get brought together. You get to the truth of the reality of unbinding. That's when you appreciate all the other truths. And where the bewilderment around suffering finally gets totally resolved. And as far as the issue of suffering is concerned, as the Buddha said, the mind will then have no more questions. Meanwhile, you still have questions. But the way to answer them is not to hope that somebody else will provide you with the answers. And that sometimes that's what you need. But other times it's simply a matter of you, of your <coughs> committing yourself to the practice, reflecting on what you're doing. And the truth will appear.